here you are, you went to US, you studied there, you worked, and you decided to come back to Greece and actually be in politics. And boy, did you choose the timing. And, uh, and especially when you were the prime minister, Greece went through, I mean, there were two, two things. One is, you actually got to be in the middle of the formation of European Union. You know, how all these very, very different countries come together and should they unite or not. So tell us a little bit about what was that time like? Was it a natural foregone conclusion? Were there a lot of conversations? How did you decide what the European Union is all about? Tell us a little bit about that time. Well, I came back to Greece as uh, I'm sure many Indians uh, from the diaspora have this desire to um, call it nostos, which is to desire to go back to your country and, and, and actually offer. Because you, you know, uh, I've been a migrant, I've been a refugee, I have been, uh, my father has been a refugee twice in his life, my grandfather six times, my great grandfather also. So, in a way, moving from one country to another, you see the differences, but then you can also see why my country, why cannot my country also do this, you know, why cannot we not learn and so that is the sort of a sense that I had of how can I help and that brought me back into politics but it was also an experience because when I was 14 um, I had a gun put to my head because they came to pick up my father and there was a dictatorship in Greece, he was put in jail and my grandfather also so I witnessed this, um, the destruction of democracy and the fight for democracy in exile. So I got quite involved with politics that way. And Europe became a project where, first of all, a peace project yeah. after the Second World War, a project where we decided that we have our differences, languages, ethnicities, different traditions. We fought each other. We went through this terrible Holocaust. Um, but we can live together in peace. Let's work together, let's open up, let's have a market together, let's have a, some basic values, let's share as a family of values, and we, we built these rules where we can work together. Uh, but Europe is still challenging, and, uh, and we are different cultures, we are, see different, different ways. When I had to deal with the financial crisis as a prime minister, and I was in the center of, not only of Europe, but of the world, yeah. people said that if Greece went, went down, and went into bankruptcy, uh, the whole global economy would collapse. It was after the Lehman Brothers, and this was sort of the new, could be the new Lehman Brothers. So everybody was calling me up from a Barack Obama, Chinese president, many others, of course, around Europe. What are you doing? But often there were lots of stereotypes coming out about the Greeks. So you're lazy and so on. I actually looked up the statistics. Greeks work more hours than any other Europeans. But of course, Greece, when you go to Greece, it's fun, you drink your ouzo, dance your zorba, and people think that it's, uh, it's, nobody is really working, but actually everybody is working to make people very happy. Um, so Europe is in a, in a, I think as in many parts of the world, we are dealing with uh, a, an amazing change uh, in, 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 in the world. Part of it is uh, Asia rising, yeah. uh, change of power, more into a multilateral than a one superpower or two superpowers. Um, and that, with the climate crisis, with the refugee crisis, with the technology change, we have um, a global south and a global north inside our societies, not only outside our societies. There is a, quite a divide. Those that are, feel that they can move with this changing world and those that feel they are, that they are left out. And I, I would say in the developed world, and Europe is part of the developed world, there are deep crises. Um, now, as we talk about how do we as leaders deal with these issues in a very, very complex, uh, maybe the most challenging times that humanity has ever faced, that this generation, the new generation, may be the most privileged as far as knowledge and technology, but the most burdened as far as uh, the, maybe the last generation to save our civilization if we talk about climate crisis. So this of course de demands types of leadership which, which I think we have to talk about. But if I were to ask you for a second, George, specifically about the time when Greece was going through this, you are at the helm and as you said, 
people are saying the country is falling apart, uh, etc. What are the things you did specifically to turn it around however you could? First of all, who were your advisors? Who were the people you reached out to and said, hey, I need help? And how did you actually, you know, put yourself through it? Is it, how do you not freak out? And how do you just stay grounded in yeah. that time? Well, it, everybody has their style, but I, there are certain beliefs in the way I, I think of leadership. And it was a difficult crisis, very difficult. As I said, everybody was, and everybody was prescribing, even though people didn't really know how we should deal with this crisis. Many of the Europeans were saying, Greece is to blame, and we did, we did have our blame. We had the previous government, when I took over, had uh, blown up the, uh, the, the um, budget. Uh, we had huge budget deficit and doubled our debt in a few years. So people were saying, yeah, you are the problem. Uh, but then there was the euro structures in a common currency, and then there was the global financial crisis. So all those three things came together in a perfect storm on Greece. Uh, I had to um, sort of toughen up, I think, a bit and say, okay, this is, I just have to do certain things to change in my country. I know there will be a political cost. And as a matter of fact, at some point I came, I went out to the public and I said, listen, somebody has to do this. These are difficult changes. I'm going to have to cut wages, cut pensions, raise taxes, uh, and make deep reforms. And I know that won't be popular. And uh, I know I will not be reelected. So I've decided that I won't be reelected as long as I make sure that I get this done. Yeah. So I want everybody to help me to get it done for our country. And, uh, and that was sort of a determination. But there are two types of things which I think in leadership we, we, we need to, to differentiate. There are some solutions which are technical, and we are, have a lot of tech people here, uh, so that you can say, yes, um, when you have a heart attack, for example, you know that you have to go through to the uh, intensive care, and there are very s standard procedures as to what you need to do. And usually people, hopefully, if they get through, they will get through and they will say, okay, you're out of intensive care. That's the technical side. And uh, many of the solutions that were offered were technical. You've got to cut wages and so on, this and that. But then there's a different side. When you leave the hospital after intensive care, uh, the doctor will say to you, you know, you have to change your life. Yeah. You have stress. You overwork. You uh, have to lose weight, maybe do exercise. Maybe you have a problem with your spouse. Uh, maybe you have to change the job. Now that is a major change. So, as a leader, how do you help in dealing with this major change in society so that your society will change in attitude, in the way of consumption, in the way we borrow, in the way we work, in the way we work with each other, in the way we govern our country? And uh, I had to... My, my feeling is that, that I had to see how we could get people to own the problem so that it was not just here I am, I will find all the solutions. Because I think we have a, a juxtaposition of, of leadership models in our, in our world. And you know, when people go through crises, they often look for immediate, because of the fear, sort of immediate, they have a knee-jerk reaction. So one is, let's say, you have a crisis, well, you hit hit by a storm, what do you do? Well, I, you go back for sa into safety, you go into your home, you go back to your tradition, traditional norms, what you think you've known over centuries maybe. You close your windows, you close your shutters, you go back to your little island, it's what, what Brexit has happened, I mean, let's close the doors, let's build the walls, let's, you know, keep the problems out. Yeah, I've sometimes thought of going to my little island too, lovely, as I said, with, you know, our wines and fishes and, 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 and swimming and so on, but the problems are out there. They, they come to you. I mean, refugees, plastics in the water or whatever, climate change. The... So, sorry, what were one or two radical things you had to do? Like, did you have to 
let go of certain people? Did you have to, I mean, were there like one or two really huge things you had to do to just even bring things to normalcy? Well, the most painful for the people, uh, for mass people, were the wage cuts and the pension cuts. So, uh, I had to cut wages in the public sector by 30% on the average, uh, and pensions the same. At the same time, we had to raise taxes. But that was sort of a, a, a symptom because underneath what we had in Greece was a system of governance that was not working. Correct. So, the, sometimes the Northern Europeans were thinking of, okay, you overspent, you just cut, that's fine. Yeah, we were a, a Southern European country with traditions of dictatorships and so on, with a governance structure which is clientelistic, and luckily a lot of corruption, so it was leaking. So I had to think of solutions which were um, quick, uh, some of them were quick fix, but they were also painful, but not so much for the citizens, but for maybe some of the powers, the, the establishment. Yeah. So for example, I decided one law, we put every expenditure online. So I went actually back to ancient Greece. The ancient Greeks would put expenditures when there was at the democratic peak. Every expenditure was etched in the walls. And you could actually, as a citizen, take, the, take a decision to court to see whether it was, to, to, to see, to have it decided whether it was a correct... Uh, it was like public declaration public of declaration. expenses. So I said, okay, what is the wall or the let's say, billboard, the, the billboard yeah. is the internet. So I put everything on the internet, and there's actually, it's, it's a stay there. Everybody could see what and where our money was going to. Yeah. So immediately that cut a lot of waste and even corruption. Another was we had multinationals paying doctors to overprescribe, uh, and patients were getting more, more medicine than they needed. And they were also then, um, that would be billed to the public yeah. sector okay. and the pension funds. We put in uh, what we called e-prescriptions. So people, uh, doctors had to go through a system of software uh, to say why, what this person had and why they, were, why they would get this prescription. The doctors initially said, we can't do it. Actually, somebody called me up from the ministry and said, um, we can't do this. The ministry said, we can't do it. And I said, why not? He said, because the doctors have said they don't know how to use computers. So I said, okay, well, just sever the contracts of any doctor that doesn't use a computer, and we move forward. In two weeks, 90% of the doctors learned how to use computers. <laughs> we cut the costs by 50%. That's 3 billion. 3 billion euros means pretty much as much as we pay in property taxes every year. So these were types of solutions which we had to move forward. Um, we had to find ways to, to tax uh, through tax evasion, uh, find tax evasion, and one was property taxes, uh, particularly on, on luxury houses and luxury pools and so on. We couldn't get people to, to, um, to tell us what they were, where they were, if they had a pool or not, so we had to use Google Earth to figure out who had a pool or who didn't have a pool. These were... So you used Google Earth to see who had pool and just knocked on the door and said you need to pay yes, this much taxes? Yes, you had taxes. to pay taxes, that's right. that's right. Did they pay? Yes, well this is what we did. We actually put a, set up a whole system for taxes. Now, there is a wider issue because people were saying, okay, people don't pay taxes in Greece, but we do have uh, a lot of tax evasion globally. So, lot, we had, it was quite a paradox where the banking system was telling us, you have to pay back your loans, but the banking system was helping people from Greece take their money out and put them in some tax haven or in some other bank ah. so that we couldn't tax them. Right. So, but this is a global issue. Right. So these right. are some of the issues. Uh, yeah. But I think what, 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 what I was trying to do, and I had tried to do all my life as far as a leader is concerned, and I think this is where leadership should be going, is we need to have people involved. We will be facing crises all the time, and I face maybe some of the biggest crises in my country and maybe globally, but I think that we will not be able to deal with these crises unless we get people involved. And this is where politics has to go. I heard 
earlier that somebody said politics is over. I don't think politics is over, but politics will be changing. But it can change in different ways. And I think we have to be active and participate to change it in the right way. On the one hand, through these crises, people often, and there are, people will see that maybe a solution is we need so-called, not a real, not in reality, so-called strong leader, somebody who looks tough, very authoritarian. I don't call them strong leaders. They are rhetorically strong. They're demagogues, but they are not necessarily strong. Or the other way is we need to get people to participate, to become part of the solution. So we have politicians who will say, I am the solution, that's the problem, I am the solution, vote for me. And I would say other way of looking at politics is, no, we are the solution. Or I know everything, or no, I don't know everything. I need to learn as a politician. Let's, work, let's listen and let's work together. Or um, looking for a scapegoat rather than looking for the problem. Yes, you know, the Chinese are the problem, the Mexicans are the problem, the Greeks are the problem. I mean, yeah. or we in Greece might say the Turks are the problem, the Turks might say the Greeks, the Indians might say the Pakistanis, the Pakistanis might say the Indians. That's one way of going in politics. The other is to say, no, let's look at the in depth, what is the real issue? And how do we own the problem and solve it together? And so, I think, sorry, yes. George, you're back in politics now. Yes. So, I mean, in the sense, when you look at Greece, it, at one point, not at one point, I mean, it has been the source of democracy, it's been the source of Olympics, it's been the source of, uh, you know, mathematics, all, all sorts of things at, at some point. And what would you like to see happen? Uh, in Greece to bring it back to where it was. What are some of the things we need, you need to do in the country to get it back to uh, where it was? Well, in, in one way, being able to tap into some of the ancient traditions and wisdom and go back to some of the discussions. Uh, the ancient Greeks didn't have all the solutions, but maybe they had a lot of the questions that we need to, to ask ourselves. I lived through a time when there was a lot of rage, and there is a lot of rage in many of our countries. But if you go back to ancient Greece, the, actually the first written Western document is the Iliad from Homer, and then the Odyssey. The Iliad begins with one word. It's the word rage. And it basically is talking about, if you read the Iliad, it's talking about these um, machismo men, super egos, um, super oppressive to women, um, fighting each other over love, or not love really, fighting each other over petty love and petty Jealousy. uh, jealousies and so on, and killing each other and blood and horror and, and really terrible. And this, these stories of heroes, of course, was read over and over and over again in generations. And I think what happened is that over generations, people started saying, well, yeah, this is we should learn from this. You know, rage is not the way to go. Egos are not the way to go. Maybe we need to find new institutions. And one of them was democracy. Democracy is, in many ways, a way to solve our problems peacefully, yeah. through debate, through, yes, difficult debates. Um, and then, of course, there was, oh, let's do games. Let's do games. Now, what are the difference? What, is game, what do games teach us? I mean, in a good sense, games. I, I make a difference between what the arena is in Rome and what the Olympics are in, in Greece. The arena is one where there are no real rules. You just kill the other person, and the emperor basically decides who dies and who does not. In the Olympics, you celebrate humanity. You celebrate the best in humanity, and if you can make it, whether you win or lose, it's you're participating in this great festival of both uh, art and... and, and, uh, and um, and physical prowess, physical capacity. So the Olympics were a, a, a way to bring peace, and actually there was the Olympic truce. The truce was no war during the games, and maybe even during the games we can find ways to, to, to bring peace. So let's think, in, in how can we bring this new way of looking at politics by using some of these old, old uh, ideas? How can we bring in our citizens to be really participatory? Well, we have our Facebooks and Googles and so on. So somebody's saying earlier, of course, everybody's linked to this. We're all, but are we really getting 
are the citizens' power, are they we really empowering our citizens? I don't believe so. Yeah. So in ancient Greece, when they would, unluckily women were not part of it, it were slaves and so on, but the idea was that those who were citizens would sit together, they would, may not like each other, but they didn't have their cocoons, they had to sit and debate each other. So why not create a fourth deliberative branch in our, in our, in our democracies, where we, it would be called a deliberative branch where we actually have an internet e-governance, an e-deliberation, e um, where citizens will give their opinion and debate issues before they become laws. Yeah. So these are the kinds of things I would like to see, new types of leadership, and I would like to see Greece could become, as we've talked about, a center where we highlight the best of our qualities, yeah. a wellness center. So a center where we have our Mediterranean diet, a center where we bring up our culture, where we enjoy uh, the basics of life, where we can really build our organic food, is sustainable uh, energy. We now have, and I push this, one island which is going to be completely sustainable, and it's going to be uh, sort of a model for what would be the future of the world yeah. on one island. So I would say, when the work we're going to be doing, why don't we think of Greece as an experiment, and maybe some of our islands as pilot projects, for what would be a future world where we are talking about a more holistic approach to life, a more wellness a more um, uh, communal and, and participatory type of, of governance. This is what I would like to work for in Greece, yeah. and in doing so, of course, possibly help many parts so of the world. So by the time we come to Greece, the future, will you be the future prime minister of uh, Greece? What are, your, what are your personal plans? My personal plans. Well, you know, I... Um, that question has been asked to me even before I became Prime Minister, and my answer was quite standard. I just want to serve. I, see, I don't see power as a value. I see the values we need to follow to frame how we use power. And if we fight for those values, whether you are in a position of authority or whether you are in a position of just creating ideas, you will move the world forward. Great. Thank you so much for your time, Thank John. You. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much.